I want to invite you this evening to open in your New Testament to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, at least as a starting place for tonight. As you turn there, I want to begin with a question this evening. Have you ever known someone who seemed to be impossible to please? Uh, Some of you may have had a teacher at some point in time who, no matter how hard you tried, was never really satisfied with your work. Uh, Some of you may work for a person like that now. It just doesn't seem to matter what you do or how much you put in. It's just never good enough. Uh, Some people even grow up with parents who are like that. It's not easy to live with or to deal with people who are are that way. And it seems to me that that some people may think of God in those terms. Uh, Maybe they even ask themselves at times, what does it take to please him? And that question may sometimes come from people who don't really have a clear understanding uh, of who God is, what he has revealed about himself in the scriptures. But in some ways, that's a perfectly valid question. What does it take to please God? In in Psalm 146, and I didn't have you turn there because I'm just going to quote it just briefly. The Bible answers that question. It says in Psalm 146 and verse 8, the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord loves the righteous. And that's what it takes to please him. God God is pleased with righteousness. And that is both a good news and and bad news sort of thing. It's bad news because none of us are. You know, that's that's why I had you turn to Romans chapter 3. In verse 10, Paul just makes the observation there that none is righteous, no, not one. Nobody fits that category. And when you look at the principles that are found all all through Scripture, you you read, for example, in 1 John 5 and verse 17, he's going to define what sin is for us. And he would say there in 1 John 5 and verse 17 that all unrighteousness is sin. And so uh, righteousness is good, unrighteousness is bad, it's sin. And we know, as the Apostle Paul would say in Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sin. You know, we've all engaged in that. We all have done things that are wrong. None of us are righteous in and of ourselves. And in light of that, it it might be hard for some people to see how there could be any good news in that scenario. It doesn't sound like it's very promising at all, but but there is good news. And the good news is that we serve the one who is referred to in Jeremiah 23 and verse 6 as the Lord our righteousness. And that's what I want us to talk about this evening, what it means for God to be our righteousness. That's one of the names or the expressions used to describe him. And as we begin, I want to point out three principles that I think are implied when we say that the Lord is our righteousness. Three things that, that go along with that, uh, with that statement. And, and the first principle is that righteousness is something that is intrinsic to God's, to God's nature. It's the very essence of God's character. Uh, have you ever thought about the fact that God is not righteous because he meets a standard that was set up by somebody else? You know, somebody set the standard and God lives up to that. That's not how God is, you know, how he's righteous. He himself is the standard of righteousness. In fact, it's impossible for him to be anything other than that. And so there's not even a, an indirect connection between God and, and wrongdoing. You can't make that kind of connection. It's impossible for him to engage in something that is wrong. And the reason it's important for us to understand this is because it means that God is righteous in all of his dealings with us. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there have been times when people have felt, you know, in one way or another that God hasn't always been right in his dealings with them. It's not uncommon for people to feel that God has done them wrong in some way. Sometimes they'll even give expression to that. And yet what we need to understand is that it's not true. It never has been the case. It is impossible for him to do that. Righteousness is part of his very nature. And the only way that he can deal with us is by doing the right thing. For example, when God gave his law to mankind, it wasn't just a list of commandments given in in some kind of arbitrary manner. The law of God is an extension of who he is. And since he is righteous, his laws are right. In fact, that statement is pretty much just made in those terms. In Psalm 119, in verse 137, the statement is made, Righteous are you, O Lord, and your laws are right. Well, that just goes together, those two principles. Uh, You may read from a translation that words that a little bit differently, but the point is basically the same, no matter which one you you find. Uh, In Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 13, 
The statement is made to God. You, you came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees and commands that are good. That's what God did. It's what he did in, under the old law when he came down on Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. Uh, he didn't quit from that point when he, when he spoke to mankind, when he revealed things. They were in keeping with those same principles. Uh, when we talk about God's judgment, even, we need to recognize that, you know, that is in keeping with the same principles that we've been talking about. He, he makes no mistakes. He doesn't, you know, uh, accidentally, you know, charge somebody with something and hold it against them. Twice in the scriptures, we're told that God will judge the world in righteousness, and that's important. Once it's in the Old Testament, in, in Psalm 96 and verse 13, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And then once in the New Testament, just to emphasize things, when Paul in Acts chapter 17 was in the city of Athens, in verse 30 of Acts 17, he would tell them, tell them that the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, he says, by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so he's going to do that in righteousness. And so we may sometimes look around and we may wonder, you know, what God, what's God going to do with this particular person or what's God going to do with that particular person? And it may be that someone, you know, who doesn't seem to be particularly faithful in our mind and we don't really know what God's going to do there. And really the only thing I know to, for sure to tell you about all of that is that God's going to do what's right. That I know. You know, I may not know the answer. I don't get the memo always, but God's going to do what is right. And on that day when we all stand before him, I believe it will be clear that he's in, in the right in his dealings with us. He will do what is right regardless of what we do. And so everything God has ever done in the past and everything he is doing at this point in time, everything that he will do in the future is in keeping with that principle, in keeping with what is right. In Psalm 145, verse 17 the Lord is righteous in all his ways. Every law, every judgment, every action, everything associated with God is in keeping with the principle of righteousness. It is intrinsic to his nature, part of his character. But that brings us to another principle that I, I want to point out. And the second principle is that righteousness is absolutely essential to having a relationship with him, with having a relationship with this God who is righteous. And one thing we need to have, I think, clearly fixed in our minds as we discuss this particular principle is that, as we've already seen, God is the standard for that. He's the standard for righteousness. And, and that's important for us to understand because what we tend to do is we tend to make ourselves the standard in one fashion or another. And when we do that, it's remarkable how well we, you know, live up to the, to the standard that we've set. Paul would speak about people like that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> And he would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 that, that when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. Or some translations say, I think they are not wise. It's not the wise thing to do. It's not wise to, to approach life in that way. We have, a, we have a designation for people who do that kind of thing. We, we, we say that people like that are self-righteous. And that's true. That was the problem, for example, in Luke chapter 18 when Jesus told a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector. That Pharisee in the parable was self-righteous. In fact, that's the reason Jesus told this parable, Luke 18 and verse 9. He said, it says that Luke tells us that he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. <coughs> they didn't get that uh, from just an honest evaluation of the scriptures and an examination of their lives, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They made themselves the standard. And what people who are, are confident in their own righteousness fail to see is that they're not the standard by which righteousness is measured. That's not how that goes. Other people are not the standard by which righteousness is measured. We don't just get to look out and say, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty well compared to everybody else. And it doesn't matter if, even if we're better than everybody else, it doesn't matter how righteous we may think we are, we fail miserably when we compare ourselves with God as the standard. And so in that parable, and again, this is a story, but let's just kind of use the, you know, the things he talked about. I'm sure the Pharisee in the parable 
did all of the things he said in his prayer to God. He prayed several times a day. I'm sure he fasted twice a week, as he said, gave a tenth of all that he had. But I'm also confident that he didn't even come close to reaching the standard of righteousness set by God. That I can be confident about. I'm not told everything about, you know, uh, this, this uh, man in this parable, but I'm, I'm confident that you can say that. And in the same way, we may do some good things from time to time. We, we may live in, in, a, in a way that, uh, you know, where, where we do things that are pleasing to the Lord. But as Isaiah would say in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. They, they just don't compare when, we, when they're measured in view of who God is. And the reason Isaiah saw that so clearly is because he saw the Lord clearly. You go back quite a few chapters to chapter 6 of Isaiah. And I want to read a few verses from that chapter because I think it sets the tone for what Isaiah, you know, what he would go on to say. <clears throat> so in Isaiah chapter 6 and beginning in verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then verse 4 says that the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." I saw God, and it highlighted my failures, the fact that I am not who I ought to be, and I don't live among people who are what they ought to be. And so you can't be confronted with the absolute holiness of God and not come to understand that you don't live up to the standards that he set. And so when we compare ourselves to God, not just with ourselves or among one another, but when we compare ourselves with God, when we truly understand who he is, we can see why the Apostle Paul would quote the Old Testament in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 and say, none is righteous, no, not one. That's the condition. That's where we are in that. And that brings us to the third principle that I want to point out this evening. Job would, once, would ask the question in Job 9 and verse 2, how can a man be in the right before God? And that's a great question. How can we be righteous especially in light of all the things that we've talked about already this evening. But I also want to point out that there is a, there's a good answer. If, there, if we're ever going to be righteous, it will be because our righteousness comes from God and not from ourselves. It's sobering, or at least it ought to be sobering, when we recognize that there is nothing that we can do to satisfy God's justice once we sin. Nothing short of being separated from him eternally, that is. And so if we're ever considered righteous in the sight of God, it will be as a result of the fact that God has made us so. It's going to be on his terms, not ours, and not anybody else's. I once read a story about a man, his name was Lee Davidson, and he, he lived in, in Colorado. He was well-liked by the people who knew him. Seemed just kind of like a normal guy, you know. And... It completely shocked everyone when they learned that his name really wasn't Lee Davidson, it was Henry Andrews, and that he was, in fact, a convicted murderer who had escaped from the Georgia State Penitentiary, Penitentiary in 1983. And the law had finally caught up with him, and they took him back to prison in Georgia. And one of his former bosses made the observation, that, you know, I think he's paid for his crime, and the the problem is that the law wasn't concerned about the opinion of his former boss or any of the other people who knew him. The law had to be satisfied regardless of what anybody else thought about that. And I want to tell you that in the same way regard, regarding our sins, we don't get to decide when we've done enough to satisfy justice. We don't get to say, you know, well, I, I think that ought to kind of cover it, you know. Um, yes, I've done some things wrong, but I think I've kind of made up for that. It doesn't matter what we think about what we've done to atone for our sins. The fact of the matter is that there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to pay the debt that we owe as a result of the sins that we've committed. 
And that's why it's important for us to be able to say that the Lord is our righteousness. It doesn't say that we're righteous because we're not, not in the strictest sense of that word. The Lord is righteous and he, and he must be our righteousness if we want to be right with him. You know, Jesus alluded to that when he said that our primary concern in life ought to be in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 to seek first the kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. We need to seek the reign of God in our lives. That is the seeking first his kingdom and, and the righteousness that only God can provide. And both of those really kind of go hand in hand. They fit together. But let me ask you this. How do we seek the righteousness of God? Where do we find the, the righteousness that can only come from him? And, and the answer to that question is that God supplies that righteousness in Christ. It's the only place it's found. You can see that even in, the, even, in the, uh, even in the passage from Jeremiah where that particular name is used. In Jeremiah chapter, um, chapter 23 and verse 5, verses 5 and 6 that is, the Lord our righteousness. And so in that passage, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So what's he referring to when he, when he says all of that? Who is this promised king from the line of David that he mentions? So he's ultimately speaking of the Messiah there. Jesus is the righteous branch of David. He is the one who is our righteousness. <clears throat> you know, many people are mistaken about their standing with God, uh, about whether or not they'll, they'll be right with him on the day of judgment. The, the only way people will be able to stand acceptable before God is to be righteous in his sight. And the only way to stand righteous in his sight is through what has been accomplished through the death of Jesus, for his, his sacrifice on our behalf. You know, Paul talked more about God's righteousness in his letter to the Romans than we see really in any other book in the New Testament. And he deals with it all through, and he even starts, kind of even his, his very theme we see in Romans chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. And, and what he says in that is this. He says, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And the, the righteousness that, that God supplies, again, <clears throat> it's only available through the gospel of Christ. There's not another way to get that. And so when you go through and you read what Paul says in Romans and in some other places as well, the Jews thought they knew all about righteousness. To them, all you had to do is you, you kept the law and you were righteous in some sense of that expression. And in some ways, I guess that would be true. But they didn't understand that once, once they had transgressed the law, once sin entered into the picture, that was no longer really an option. And so Paul dealt with that principle again in Romans chapter 3. And we see, in, for example, in verse 20, that by works of the law, no human being will be justified or made righteous in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of, of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's where it's found. And everything about the gospel went against the way the Jews thought about righteousness. Paul would talk about that, for example, in chapter 4 of this letter in in verse 1 beginning he says what then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh for if Abraham was justified by works he had something to boast about but he doesn't have anything to boast about before God for what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness now to the one who works his wages are not counted as a gift but as his due if you're working for something you get what you pay, what you you know what you put in but, but Paul says that's not how it is with our salvation. To the one who does not work, and it doesn't mean somebody who doesn't do anything, it just means to the person who's not trying to earn a paycheck, so to speak, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, his allegiance, his faithfulness is counted as righteousness. 
And then he tells us how that works. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the one to whom God counts righteousness. How is righteousness counted to us apart from the works of the law? Here's how it's done. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count sin. How are you and I righteous? Not by what we've done. We are righteous because God in Christ hasn't held to our account the things that we have done, the sins that we have committed. That's how we become righteous, through forgiveness. And I think this also goes against many of the commonly held ideas that people in our day have about righteousness as well. And the idea that many people seem to have is that you know, God's going to just kind of set up a scale and he's going to place all the good stuff we've done on one side and all the bad stuff on the other side to see, to see which of those weighs the most. And that's kind of where you're going to end up. And that assumes that good things and bad things carry equal weight before God. But what the scriptures tell us is that even one sin held to our account is going to outweigh everything else. You can't have anything on your account. And the only way to be right with God is to have our sins removed from our account through Christ. And what we have in Jesus is one who is willing to pay the debt that we owed because of our sins. And the only way we could have satisfied that debt on our own was by our death. The wages of sin is death. That's what we had earned, Paul would say. And that's what the death of Jesus was all about. Paul said in Romans 4 and verse 25 that he was delivered up for our trespasses because of what we had done. And there are a number of passages that we could look at that tell us basically the same thing. Jesus gave himself for us. For example, Peter in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18 would say that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. He's the righteous, we're the not. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In the spirit. And what each of us did when we sinned, in essence, is, is we substituted ourselves for God. We asserted ourselves against God, and we placed ourselves where only God deserves to be, in the position of authority, the position of the right to act. And what salvation involves is God substituting himself for us in the person of Christ. God sacrificed himself, and he placed himself where we deserve to be. The, the, the chastisement that brought us peace, uh, uh, Isaiah 53 would say, it fell upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's the only way that could take place. Or as Paul would put it in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, for our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's, how that, that's the only way that was accomplished. And so the only way to be found righteous by God is to be found in Christ. Paul would say in Philippians 3 and verse 9, that his desire was to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, he said, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And so God offers righteousness in Christ, and that righteousness is made available on the basis of faith. But the question I want to ask now is this, how does faith put us into Christ? How does that happen? And I think that the answer in Scripture goes against what so many people in our world today have, have concluded about that, that you just kind of believe and now you're there. I mean, wham, you're in Christ. But Paul answered that question for us in one of his other letters. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, Paul would say there that in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Okay, that's what we've been talking about. But then he says, Here that, here's how that took place. For, because, in verse 27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so Paul, in these verses, in verse 26, he wasn't talking about having faith in Christ. I mean, that's, that's, that's in there. But he was talking about being in Christ by faith. That's slightly different. He's talking about where our location is. We are in Christ, and we get there by faith. But the way you get into Christ by faith is by being buried with him in baptism. In Colossians chapter 2, in verses 11 and 12, Paul would say, in him, and that's how many times you see that expression, in him or in Christ, in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. 
That's how it takes place. Now, I'm reminded of a story about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I like reading Abraham Lincoln stories. I think they're interesting. He was, he was walking along a, a country road and a wagon pulled up beside him and he, and he said to the driver, he said, could I ask you to do me a favor? Could you take my coat into town? And the driver said, well, I'm, I'd be happy to do that, but how are you going to get it back? And Lincoln, in his, I'll just be honest, weird way, he was a weird guy, I think, he said, that's easy, I, I plan to remain in it, <laughs> you know. This is a weird way of saying, can you give me a ride? I mean, I, I, why can't you just say that, you know, but that's not what he did. And I'll just tell you, though, that that's similar to what the Bible says about how we get to where we want to be in the world to come, be with God in heaven is that we get into Christ and we remain in him because that's how you get there. Paul would say in Romans 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's where the condemnation is no more. If you're not in Christ, there is condemnation. But if you are in Christ, there's no condemnation. And so can I ask you a question this evening? Where are you? Are you in Christ? Have you been baptized into Christ? Are you abiding in him? It's not like a one-time thing and you never have to worry about it again. You need to stay there. We need to abide in him. But as far as being right with God is concerned, he is our only hope. He is the Lord, our righteousness. And if you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, why not, why not do that tonight? Why not seek God in the only place where he can be found, where you can be right with him? And if we can help you with that, we ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.